Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Fo. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network, and I want to welcome you to our first ever UNC Cancer Network North Carolina Community College Lecture. Uh, just a, a few preliminaries before we get started. Uh, if you have any trouble at all with the sound or any technical difficulties, there are a few ways that you can let us know about that. You may email us at unccn at unc.edu. You may call or text us at 919-445-1000. In uh, just a few minutes, we're going to use something called Poll Everywhere, and you'll start that off with a uh, text with the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. And then once you do that, and you can do that now if you like, then you'll be able to uh, answer a poll question. And then at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to ask questions, again, using poll everywhere with, with a computer or a smartphone. Uh, let's see, what else do I need to tell you? You can check us out on the web at unccn.org. There you'll find out information about the UNC Cancer Network, about this particular lecture series for the community colleges, as well as a variety of other lecture series that we're sure will interest you. Uh, find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash unccn or on Twitter at at unc underscore cn. Okay. Let's go ahead. I mentioned that poll everywhere poll. We can take a moment to do that right now. The question is, based on estimates by the American Cancer Society, what percentage of new cancer cases in 2016 involve breast cancer in females? So uh, if you know this, you can go ahead and answer with authority. If you're not sure, go ahead and answer anyway. And uh, you can pick your best guess, A, 3%, B, 8%, C, 13%, D, 29%, or E, not sure. And again, just to get that fired off, you text the, the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. You do that just one time, and then you can text A, B, C, D, or E with your answer. We are very pleased to have Amy Depew here with us today. And Amy is a breast cancer nurse navigator at North Carolina Cancer Hospital at UNC Chapel Hill. Amy received the Nursing Recognition Award from UNC Hospitals and the UNC School of Medicine for her leadership, diligence, and unwavering dedication to patient care and happiness. Amy, welcome. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here today. Let, let me ask, but before we get started with the lecture, tell us and, and tell our audience about the role of the Nurse Navigator. Sure. Um, nurse Navigation is, is relatively new to um, medicine as a whole. Uh, probably about 10, maybe 12 years ago, it started becoming a big uh, topic of conversation, mostly for um, pretty much for breast cancer patients who were having a new diagnosis that, that kind of rocked their world and we had to try to get something right. So if you think about the term of nurse navigator, we are, are registered nurses, sometimes master degree nurses, who help patients find their way from one end, beginning at diagnosis, to hopefully a successful um, survivorship. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank and I, I know you're phenomenal in that role. We'll go ahead and see what we have gotten from this poll now. All right. So it looks like uh, we've got uh, 3%, uh, no one, 14%, 21%, D, 57%, and E, not sure. Very good. All right. So. Pretty good numbers. And with that, we'll go ahead and, and let you take it away. Great. Caring for the patient with breast cancer. Yes. I'll pass that over thank to you, you so you've got all the you. navigation tools you need there. No pun intended. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And I think this is just a wonderful way to um, introduce the concept of cancers um, in general and breast cancer very fitting for the month of October, as we know. Um, so, so just to kind of introduce a few of the concepts that, that we're going to have um, here. Our objectives today are going to, going to be talking um, on a pretty base level about um, cancer itself, particularly, as I said, breast cancer. We're going to talk about the types of breast cancer, what staging actually means, diagnostic tests to get us there. Um, we'll, we'll touch a little bit about treatment options, uh, managing some side effects and emotional needs of, of our cancer patients, and 
then I think very interesting and very um, close to my heart the, the importance of what nursing itself can do for breast cancer patients and why we need a collaborative team um, when we are dealing with these cancer patients. Uh, by definition, we know that cancer is um, a rapidly growing cell um, in breast cancer. Of course, we would, would be noting the breast cancer in the, in the breast tissue. Um, sounds kind of easy, but it can get a little bit difficult to deal with when we start to figure out that there are other aspects of the breast cancer that, that we are talking about. If you'll notice in this uh, picture of a woman's breast, we have um, lymph nodes, those nice little green um, kind of pearl looking things uh, crawling up the side of the breast. That can change a patient's uh, breast cancer stage. So we need to figure out um, We'll, we'll talk about this as we go along. We need to figure out just exactly what we mean about what piece of the breast we're talking about. Um, incidence and survival of breast cancer in the United States. This is a very interesting, um, interesting slide we have here. here. We, it looks like females are going to run an 843,000 and up newly diagnosed cancer patients. And if you look at... Um, the little red box right there, 29% of those newly diagnosed cancer uh, patients will be breast cancer patients. That is in 2016. That kind of, kind of blows your mind. Um, estimated cancer deaths in the United States for females is 281,000. And if you look, 14% of that number is going to be breast cancers. We do know that breast cancer is second in the United States for um, cancer deaths in, in women, um, lung, of course, being top, but um, those numbers are huge, 14%. So symptoms and signs of breast cancer. A lot of people tend to think that you, um, if you feel any kind of lump in your breast, that's going to indicate that we are, um, that we have a positive diagnosis. That's not always true. Um, there are other indications. Uh, women can have a, have a new um, skin irritation that shows up that doesn't go away. It sometimes gets larger. Um, there is often a what we call a poudre orange uh, look to the to the skin of the breast. It will look like almost like the outside of an orange peel, um, kind of rough and bumpy. Um, you can have breast pain, which we have always thought before did not really indicate a breast cancer, but it it can. Um, when the nipple uh, does, isn't normally retracted and all of a sudden it, it, it is, that is a, an indication that we have something that is building in there and kind of pulling back on that area of the breast. Um, any discharge for any patient, but particularly non-nursing mothers, non-lactating mothers, um, can indicate a need for some um, imaging and a, and a trip to the doctor's office. So the types of breast cancer that we talk about um, overall can vary. Um, there's, you need to understand the difference between what is a, an invasive cancer and what is a non-invasive cancer. Um, if you take a look at this picture, it's like the first one that we saw, you'll see um, the really biggest components of breast cancer, which if you start towards the back and you look where the rib cage is and then you see a, a row of muscles, it's really important to keep that in mind. And you'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you look at the lobes of the breast, those things that look kind of like grape clusters, um, and then you see that line that comes out and goes towards the nipple, those are ducts. Um, if you look at the nipple itself, you see the brown part, the areola. These are all pieces of the breast that are very important when you're discussing breast cancer. Um, ducts in, the, in and of themselves can have two different types of breast cancer. Um, ductal carcinoma in situ is a, is a breast cancer that is exactly what those two words mean, in situ, at that site. If you think about it as a, almost like a... a a ball, a round ball, even a golf, golf ball, 
that will grow around itself, but it doesn't develop any tentacles or it doesn't grow, that's what ductal carcinoma is. Invasive carcinoma is actually the, the breast cancer that, that um, will grow tentacles and it will travel up and down that, um, the duct that you see and can invade into the fatty tissue of the breast and elsewhere. Lobular carcinoma is something else that we, we see a lot of and those, that's exactly carcinoma that is sitting inside that lobe any of those lobes. Abnormal cells, you have to consider the fact that these are all abnormal cells. Um, some of them will, will leave the breast tissue and some will not. And that's the difference between in situ and invasive. Inflammatory breast cancer is, um, is a very, um, it's not rare, but it is something we don't see as often. It is, um, a cancer that will appear as just a red swollen breast and some people will think that it's possibly a breast infection. So the, usually the first time that we see this on a patient who doesn't have a history of breast cancer, um, she or he may be um, uh, treated with some antibiotics first, but what we know is the antibiotics are not going to help that at all. Um, so we need to, to move forward pretty quickly. Inflammatory breast cancer is a very rapidly uh, advancing type of cancer. So how do we detect breast cancer to begin with um, outside of those, those pieces that we talked about with the, the um, some um, skin changes or ductal changes, some, some fluid that might uh, come through the the nipple. So the three types of screening that we have are mammograms. Everybody kind of dreads getting those mammograms, but they're very important. Clinical breast exams, which is what happens every time you have a mammogram or when you come to see a breast uh, uh, specialist, you're going to have a clinical exam done. The other thing that we can sometimes use is an MRI, um, which is a used in a machine that will gather, it will go deeper into the breast tissue and we can see some of those things that are hidden, particularly for patients, women who have very dense breasts. Um, those are often used if we suspect there is something sitting there and we really can't see it or feel it, an MRI is a good option. So when we think about the mammogram, I'm sure um, from some of you younger folks, your moms may have complained about having to go get this mammogram. It can be uncomfortable. The um, machine that you see here in this picture actually is, is sometimes called a contortionist machine um, because of the way we have to move the body to get all views. We like to want to go all up and down the side and, and sometimes even pull towards the underarm or the axilla. A clinical breast exam is something that you're going to have from a physician or a healthcare specialist like a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. Um, there is a specific way that we look at the breasts um, and the way that we feel. It will be a circular um, outside to in and we will go all the way up, up under the arm, which is the axilla, um, to see if there is any palpable node. The reason why we want to do these things is because we want to catch a breast cancer as quickly as we can. Sometimes um, to help us determine um, if there is anything that might be aside or outside of the, the tissue in that breast, we will use other um, pieces of, of imagery like the MRI machine that I mentioned earlier. Um, actually, anybody who has a genetic uh, mutation that, will, that is done through blood work, like a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 patient um, is a good candidate for that MRI. Family history, the first degree relative um, of a patient, um, mother, uh, even a father, grandmother, uh, sister, those are all people who will want to be um, looked at more closely and even if we don't find anything, we will want to keep them on a high risk um, protocol so that we are seeing them more often. There can be genetic syndromes such as the uh, lee fraumeni or Cowden syndrome, which are, are patients who actually have a genetic disposition towards having more than one cancer, and breast cancer would be one of those. 
Risk factors are very important to keep in mind with all of our breast cancer patients. We have, uh, have um, modifiable risk factors as well as non-modifiable risk factors. And if you keep it in perspective of what you can change and what you can't change, um, we know that a family history of breast cancer, something you cannot change, is going to indicate a high risk for, for breast cancer. Um, cancers, as we said, that are inherited, that uh, gene mutations that, that can hit um, a family and cause breast cancers to be discovered in multiple family members, women and, and sons. Um, we know that certain medications that are out there, uh, like estrogens, um, can cause, can be a risk factor. Um, but at, on, on the, at the same time, can also in a pa patient who has uh, a history of breast cancer can can work with that. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Some of the uh, unmodified, non -mod uh, the mod excuse me, modifiable um, risk factors that that we can deal with too are things like um, weight, uh, lifestyle, like alcohol, um, smoking cigarettes. Those are things that. that you need to keep in mind for being changeable or modifiable. So what we talk about when we talk about diagnosis of a breast cancer, um, those are we're going to talk about those tests that, that we use to examine the breast. We have been talking about that here for just a little bit. Um, we need to diagnose cancers as quickly as we can um, in order to keep them in a, in a curative stage. Um, once the cancer is found, we need to kind of figure out how extensive that cancer is, um, what phenotype that cancer is, um, what meaning how how that cancer is um, it presents itself inside the body. Is it uh, related to estrogen levels? Is it uh, triple negative breast cancer, meaning it doesn't grow because of of estrogen or progesterone? So we call this kind of staging. Once we um, are in a diagnosis, we want to know if that cancer is still maintained in the breast or if that cancer has um, kind of filtrated through the serum and the lymph system and is now sitting somewhere else in, that bo in the body. Um, we will uh, start this at the very beginning of, of the treatment line. Um, if we have, for example, a woman who might have a very small stage one tumor, but she's got a couple of lymph nodes that we have felt or that we suspect are there and that tests positive, we're going to want to know if this little tiny cancer that we found in the breast is actually set up housekeeping in another part of the body, such as the lung or the liver, uh, brain, bones. So we will use our... Uh, our imaging machines to do that. So, what are we, we, we talking about when we're, when we're talking about staging, um, especially with the lymph nodes? Oftentimes you will hear that a patient is a stage one with metastatic disease in an axillary region with one node positive. That's not a tr true metastatic um, Diagnosis, we know that it's in a lymph node, but if we can do things like a sentinel lymph node biopsy, what, we're, what we may find out is that that is the only place that that tumor has gotten to. So in this first panel, you can see the tumor, that pink and kind of darkish colored um, area there in the upper quadrant um, is the tumor that we're talking about, and all the little green things, remember, are lymph nodes. So a surgeon will inject some dye into this area and track it through the lymph system to see what, what we say is light up, which means the dye has actually settled into a lymph node that has cancer in it. What we can do then is um, further diagnose the, the breast cancer and um, sometimes just go ahead and remove those lymph nodes. We use several different imaging processes. This is a, a chest x-ray that we will use sometimes, not um, solely to diagnose breast cancer, but sometimes to see if there are other areas that we need to be paying attention to. 
This is a CT scan. Um, if you've never seen one of these, it's like that big round donut. You, you will take some dye in. Uh, we use CT scans in breast cancer with contrast and without contrast for good comparison. Those patients will lay down, be comfortable, slide into that machine, and whatever lights up from the dye is an indication there may or may not be cancer there. We, can, we will do a CT scan in conjunction with a bone scan for patients doing the same staging. So a bone scan, the CT scan will hit softer tissues. Bone scan is just as it says. It's a, it scans the bones to see if there is anything that, um, any cancer that has set up in any of the bone marrow. A PET scan is, uh, we call a PET CT, and that is uh, a scan that is very similar to the CT, except we don't have to use contrast with it. So um, it is safer for some of our older patients uh, who have, may have renal um, function, dysfunction, that it is also a diagnostic test for us. So we use the staging because we need to find out if there is, is, is a palpable node or if we suspect uh, through side effects or, or um, patient's um, history that there is something that has spread to another part of the body. And as I said before, that is going to usually be someplace bone, um, lung, liver, or brain. And we will use the staging to help us set up what type of treatment we need to to have. The one thing that as we get through a couple of more slides, we're going to talk about the stages of breast cancer itself. And the one thing that I want you to remember is that we, until we know otherwise, um, we are headed for a curative um, treatment plan. So here are the stages of breast cancer. And this can get, for some folks, can get very confusing, so I'm going to tell you a little hint. The stage zero is always going to be a carcinoma in situ, either the ductal carcinoma in situ or a lobular carcinoma in situ, in situ at the site. Stage one, two, three, and four are going to be a little bit different. The ones, twos, and threes are going to be curative intent. Those are going to, dis those are going to be distinguished between size of the tumor that is there and number of nodes and where those nodes lay in the body that, that have a positive um, set, uh, set of cancer cells. Stage four is metastatic, and once we have a, a stage four diagnosis, that is, is um, going to be a palliative type of treatment that we offer these patients. Once the tissue is out, um, the cancer is out of the breast tissue itself, then um, we will do our very best to keep the cancer at bay from growing or um, keep the patient very comfortable. So stage zero, as I said, carcinoma in situ, if you remember the ducts that lead from the lobules and, and the areola, those uh, cells are going to set up in the center of that duct and they're just going to grow from its core. It's not going to develop any tentacles. It's just going to get bigger. As you can see, the, um, the, the piece of this uh, slide, this part of this slide that's most important is that you can kind of see the difference. Um, the normal lobula, lobular up at the top, those are all, that's a completely normal uh, lobular section of the breast. But when it gets the lobular carcinoma in situ, you can see that it's completely covering um, the ducts. Stage one is going to depend on the size of the tumor. So anything that's less than two centimeters, about the size of a little peanut, um, we're going to call as a stage 1A breast cancer. If there is, are a couple of nodes involved or if there is no tumor but there are nodes involved, um, we will call that a stage 1B. Again, curative. Stage two is going to be a little bit bigger. It's going to involve one to three lymph nodes. So the concept here with each of these stages is the bigger the tumor, the more lymph nodes involved, the larger the stage will be from one, two, or three. As you can see, the difference between a peanut and a lime is quite big. Breast tissue itself can be soft and dense, and um, if you feel it, can feel 
the, the mass itself, that's going to be something that the clinician um, is going to measure to kind of give us a clinical idea. Um, it will can and will change um, once we get the patient in and get some imaging done. So stage two, you can see this is the same thing. It's uh, talking about the size. Again, the size of the mass with the number of nodes. If you look at the third piece of this slide, um, you can see the collarbone in each one of these, but you'll see some lymph nodes that are encroaching up and out of that um, collarbone, and that's where we're getting more um, to a stage three. And there's the stage 3B that um, any inflammatory breast cancer is going to be a stage 3 because it's now infiltrating the skin. If it's uh, close to the chest wall and it's large, uh, we're going to call that a stage 3. And then the lymph nodes, if there are lymph nodes involved, um, the higher those go up the, up the, the cervical chain, um, the more likely it's going to be a stage 3. Again, all of these one, two, and three stages are curative intent. The surgery might be different, radiation might be different, but we can attack this, um, most of these with chemotherapy, which we'll talk about. And here you see stage four. This is the, the, uh, the areas that I had talked about before, the brain, the lung, the liver, and the bone. Um, metastatic disease varies by process, so uh, what might be somebody who has lung uh, metastatic disease in the lung will have breast to still be called breast cancer, but metastatic to the lung. It is not lung cancer, uh, but it is breast tissue that is, has cancer that has migrated to the lung. So that's true with each one of these disease processes. Uh, of the five, we have five treatments plans for chemotherapy, uh, for breast cancer patients, I'm sorry. We usually start out with surgery. The surgeons are the first people who tend to um, have our breast cancer patients in their clinics, and that's because this is a, a question that the mammographers will then send once we get somebody who has a, a positive um, Suspicious BIRAD 6 or 5 or 6 needs a biopsy to determine whether this is breast cancer. They'll send those folks to the surgeons to decide how best to biopsy that breast. Radiation folks are radiation oncologists. Um, we'll talk about what happens post-surgical, possibly post-chemotherapy. Um, mastectomy patients will need to have some radiation therapy as well as those folks who have positive lymph nodes. Chemotherapy is a systemic, and that's where the medical oncologists come in. The medical oncologists will also talk about hormone therapy, which um, is difficult for some folks to think about. It's not exactly hormone therapy. It's an anti-hormone therapy. Um, targeted therapy we'll discuss a little bit, but that is, that is a therapy that actually the body uses um, in conjunction with medication to help um, cure breast cancer. So our treatment options with surgery um, have changed somewhat over the years. Uh, used to be that we thought way back before the turn of the century, several centuries ago, we used to just take the breast tissue um, and thereby thinking that we were going to stop the, the cancer from spreading or, or growing or coming back. We know now that there is breast conserving surgery, which is... Um, a wonderful thing for some of our patients who have smaller uh, tumors or tumors that can be debulked um, by chemotherapy, making them smaller so that we have an aesthetically pleasing look after surgery. Um, they will, the surgeons in this type of surgery will, will do lymphadenectomies um, or sentinel node dissections if they need to. If you see in this picture here where the tumor is lower in this, this outer section, um, they, the thought is if that tumor is big enough and maybe laid against the chest wall, um, the surgeon can possibly get as much of that as they can, and that would be when radiation would step in. These are called 
simple mastectomies or total mastectomies. They're going to take the entire breast tissue, um, possibly depending on whether the nipple is involved, they will um, look at a nipple sparing mastectomy, which where they save the, the nipple for reconstruction later, but they do take the entire breast tissue and possibly some lymph nodes. Modified radical mastectomy is going deep into that. If you look, look there on the, the far right, from far left, um, the circle extends to the ribs, and so they're going to take that muscle, that chest wall muscle there when they do this, this mastectomy, and that's a radical mastectomy. Radiation treatment, as we have talked about before, is uh, actually a machine that uses um, emits radiation beams. It's called an external radiation beam. If we um, want, we need to kind of what I, I used to call seal the deal with radiation. Um, once surgery is done, once chemotherapy is finished, then the radiation oncologist will step in and they will add another layer of risk reduction so that these curative um, cancers will not return. Um, and they will pinpoint where in the breast area tissue has been taken that we need to, to hit with radioactive beams to um, possibly halt growth of any minor tissue that, has, that maybe has been left over, called, called a, um, a, a not clear. The, the surgeons will say that they could not get clear margins, that, that maybe that the cancer has gotten too close to a chest wall and then we need to have radiation. Internal radiation is when we use needles um, or seeds. We'll seed a place that um, needs to have very specific radioactive um, substances and that patient then has to be um, kind of secluded for a couple of days, sometimes up to a week. We don't use that very often in breast cancer, but it is an option. Chemotherapy is systemic treatment for breast cancers, and, um, and we have several different chemotherapy regimes that we will use depending on the size of the cancer itself, the nodes that are involved, the age of the patient, the patient's um, presenting comorbidities. But each one of these chemotherapies you have to consider is, is going from a, a vein in the arm, um, sometimes through a port in the uh, chest area. Um, sometimes it is oral, but the thing that we need to remember, the, the piece about this that is most important is that chemotherapy um, is going for cell kill of that cancer. And there are other things that we need to take into consideration as we're giving this, and so we'll talk about that in just a minute. The hormone therapy that I mentioned before, things that I'm sure um, almost everybody has heard of, things like tamoxifen. Um, there are, are um, uh, other anti-hormone uh, medications called aromatase inhibitors. Tamoxifen is different than an aromatase inhibitor because it actually goes into the um, into the body and anywhere that where there's a possibility that there's cancer growing and it is it is living off of or grows because of an estrogen in the woman's body, uh, tamoxifen goes in and sits in receptor sites and seals off that area so the the cancer is not growing and possibly dies because it doesn't get what it needs from the estrogen. It is not removing estrogen from the body. It is simply covering the cancer sites. The aromatase inhibitors, on the other hand, um, will go through and actually use the body to help turn off a protein that then eventually becomes um, estrogen that will then feed the tumor bed. A luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone agonist is um, an injection that we give to some metastatic women um, to help within this, with the same process causing an anti-hormone uh, body so that there is, there is no, um, no food source for the, for the tumor bed. And this is just as I had said, 
uh, about the aromatase inhibitor, we do have some oral, another oral agent. All the aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen, of course, are oral agents take, taken by pill one day, um, one, once a day uh, for up to five, maybe ten years, depending on the patient and the cancer type. But we also, for some of our older folks, will use an anti-estrogen called meg megase or meg megastrol, megestrol, depending on how you want to where you want to put the emphasis on the syllable. Um, it is also used for older folks a lot of times because they are not able to take some of the anti-hormone um, aromatase inhibitors. So our treatment options with targeted therapy is kind of bringing us up to, the, to speed with um, what's new in chemotherapy itself. We have monoclonal antibodies, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, PARP inhibitors, all of these different types of targeted therapy actually use the body itself to help eradicate uh, cancer cells. They will often be used with a chemotherapy so that you've got a two-sided um, attack. You've got cell kill plus the body that is, is uh, using this medicine to help stop this natural hormone. Um, all of this is based on the type of breast cancer that a patient has. So when we talk about staging and we talk about the at the very beginning doing all those set studies to see what is going on inside of breast cancer, um, some of these are based on whether or not a patient is hormone uh, positive, ER positive, PR positive, or HER2 new positive. Um, not all of these agents can be used with every single breast cancer. So now we're going to talk a little bit about side effects because you know there's never any time that you have an illness that you take a medication that you don't have some little side effect that goes on with it. Um, radiation therapy is... Um, is what some folks would think of as rather harmless, but a lot of my patients tell me that, that radiation treatments themselves um, are very lengthy. They, the fatigue is um, a cumulative fatigue, so they, and they start this after they've had several other therapies. So if you have a patient who starts out with surgery and then she, um, even if it's not the total surgery, she's had a couple of biopsies and she goes on for some chemotherapy and then surgery and then radiation treatments, you have to think about how tired that person is going to be. And it's not a tired that is easily taken care of by good nutrition and sleep. It is a, it is a tired that is, is happening because the body is fighting for its homeostasis. You know, very remember the very first part of, of uh, anatomy and physiology. The body has to maintain a certain, certain balance, and we have gone in through several different directions and, um, and had to attack that body's balance because it's being attacked by a cancer. So um, one of the biggest side effects for radiation therapy is fatigue. The other is arm lymphedema. If these patients are having this radiation because they've got, had some lymph nodes that they found were positive and then were removed. We want to go in with radiation to help um, reduce the, the risk of recurrence. So they've taken some lymph nodes, and that all that lymph fluid needs to know where to go. And it doesn't know where to go. It accumulates, and then you have lymphedema. Um, there is also a slightly higher risk of developing breast cancer in uh, the other breast when we have radiation. Chemotherapy has, has quite a few side effects that we need to, to take into consideration, the biggest of which are um, in certain chemotherapies, we, we use a cardiotoxic drug, um, so we have to be aware of possible heart failure, even latent heart failure, weeks or months after a specific uh, drug, adriamycin, that we use uh, in first line has been given. Blood clots um, are pretty um, prevalent in most cancer patients, um, premature menopause. We're, we're messing with people's hormones, with women's hormones, and so uh, women of, of even younger years can be thrown into a premature menopause um, 
which for them is not um, pleasant. Uh, we can sometimes cause leukemia because we have eradicated the bone marrow in some instances with some of our chemotherapy treatments. So the best way to manage these side effects um, completely depends on the system that it's affecting. We will use medications to help. Uh, neuropathy, for example, is a medication that is a, is a side effect of some platin uh, chemotherapies that causes tingling in the, in the hands and feet of a chemotherapy patient, and that can last after chemotherapy is over for months. It may last, and it may be bad enough just for some patients that they can't button a shirt, they can't put shoes on, so we need to help medicate that to help alleviate that. Oftentimes, post-chemotherapy, post-surgery, post-radiation, meaning after all of these, um, we will um, offer the patient a tincture of time. And what that means is we want them to get busy, get back to their normal, even if it's a new normal, um, and kind of wait these things out. There we go. So patient characteristics have to be have to be considered in each one of these treatments. If we have we have need to consider the age of a patient, if that patient is elderly and has a few other problems with their uh, systems, we want to take that into consideration. Renal function, liver functions. We're going to look at baseline labs. We're going to look at that the patient's past history, and we have to take that in consideration under into each one of those disciplines that we talked about, the surgery, radiation oncology, um, and uh, chemotherapy. You need to uh, be aware of, of what your patient's lifestyle is. Smokers, for example, don't heal very well after surgery, and if, if they are a heavy smoker and they've had surgery and it is taking a, quite a bit of time to heal, then um, we're delaying chemotherapy and that can be a, a delay in a good outcome. You have to take the emotional needs of breast cancer patients uh, into consideration. Psychosocial issues, um, family issues, what resources do they have? Almost all of us have very limited resources. Each one of us, us meaning healthcare folks, have very limited resources to help these people. Um, we, we're talking about moms who have younger children at home. We're talking about um, grandparents who are needed to babysit. We, you have to look at the entire picture and help these folks figure out how they are going to best come in for treatment. Um, what, it, what it may take to um, get them through treatment. Um, you also have to consider the caregiver burnout. Those folks who come with these patients every single day to every, every single uh, visit also are at risk. So we have, to keep, um, we have to keep that balance going. So we need to look at what our resources are to offer these folks. It's very important as nurses that we um, keep this in mind. We're not just treating that disease. We're treating the entire patient and we're treating the entire family. So having said that, um, we have to keep in mind this mind-body-spirit. We know our disease process and we know what we can do for these folks, so education is the biggest part of what we're going to do for a lot of these, these patients. Um, we, can, we can show them how to do things. We can show them how to take medications appropriately so that they're not so sick, or we can show them how to take medications so uh, they don't, they don't have problems through chemotherapy. But the biggest part about breast cancer is, and most cancers in general, is that if you are given a diagnosis of cancer, that's often the only thing that you can think about for months and months and months. You, it's an, almost like an automa automative um, body that's going through and just doing what they're told to do, but not making a connection with how important it is to heal inside as well as out. So whatever you can do for, for a cancer patient or a breast cancer patient in particular um, is going to be the right thing. So you, you extend yourself and um, you're not going to go wrong. So having said that, Maya Angelou, one of our um, great North Carolinians, 
um, made this statement uh, that I think is very important for us to keep in mind, and that is that no matter how you feel about a breast cancer patient, no matter how that breast cancer patient got to you, um, kindness is going to be your best ally, and they'll remember that. So thank you very much. Amy, thank you. That was an, a tremendous wealth of information. Uh, we really appreciate the, the way that you shared that with us. Uh, one, two, uh, we have a few references here. Is there anything specifically you'd call out for any of these? So one of the things that I think um, as nurses, you're going to find that your patient has gone to Dr. Google. Mm -hmm. And that means they've, they've put in, a, they've gone to their computer and they've put in some kind of side effect or even the, the um, disease process itself. And they're going to come back to you and they're going to say, well, Google said, so what I like to do is give my patients, um, depending on where they are mm -hmm. in, their, in their process, one of these um, specific sites uh, to go to to look at because these are, these are the people that we turn to. Mm -hmm. These are the folks who run a lot of clinical trials and help us um, deal with, with breast cancer every day. So these, these are the top three um, American Cancer Society being probably the one that is going to be more lay um, mm -hmm. for the patients who they easily and more easily mm -hmm. understood. So these are the reputable sites as Very opposed to sites. when people just start to find more off the wall information. Correct. Terrific. All right. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder, we're going to, to uh, open this up for Q&A now. And so if you have a question, uh, if you haven't already done so, you only need to do it once during, during the afternoon here, but to text the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. And once you've done that, you can start texting your questions. Uh, so we'll go ahead and bring up our Poll Everywhere poll. We'll see if we have any questions yet. Okay. If we don't, uh, we'll look for those questions very soon. I've got a couple that, that I'll ask while we're waiting sure. for other questions to come in. So you mentioned a port. Um, tell, tell us what a port is and, and how that's relevant to cancer treatment. So we have gotten used to calling um, this device a port a cap. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually just it's a port that sits underneath the skin. It's mm -hmm. a subcutaneous um, device that we use to give fluids and chemotherapy, mm -hmm. chemotherapy most often. We do draw um, labs through it, but it is a device that, um, that takes a special um, radiologist. We do it in interventional radiology. There are surgeons mm -hmm. out in the community who will also put them in, but um, it's a, about a quarter-sized uh, device that has a, a hard um, back to it. It's got a silicone center and we use a non-coring needle. Okay. Put that needle in when the patient is there and they receive their treatment. We mm -hmm. pull the needle when it's over and the patient goes home with the port still under the skin and has and, and they have no worries with what they need to do with that port. They don't have to take care of it. We do. All right. All thank, of it's done. Thank you for explaining that. And we do have our first question coming in. Does being on birth control put you at risk for breast cancer? So, yes, it can. Um, it, a lot depends on the age of the patient while they're on birth control and how long they've been on birth control. Um, as we know, estrogen is one of the uh, culprits for developing breast cancer, and these hormones actually um, raise the estrogen level in your body. So if you're if you are at high risk for developing breast cancer through um, family other family members or um, genetics alone, then you probably should think twice about being on birth control. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, uh, one one text UNCCN to two two three 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 and then you can go ahead and text in your questions. Here we go. Would you recommend breast thermography over a standard mammogram in order to reduce the possibility of exposing the breast to unnecessary radiation? That's a really, really good question, and that's um, something that is coming up more and more um, 
with our radiologists. We do not do breast thermography to my knowledge. I can be wrong. I have been wrong in the past. Uh, standard mammography is not going to give you enough radiation to um, put that um, put that put your put the patient to risk at at, at, at a higher risk. All right, thank you. And from VGCC, what are risks risk factors for males? So um, males are are also at risk if they have a family member um, who has has a uh, genetic uh, BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. Um, family members, if they've got a long line of first degree relatives with family members, they are also at risk. And yet you mentioned BRCA1 and BRCA2 earlier, mm -hmm. and I, I think some mm -hmm. of us may be familiar with, with the, the reference to BRCA with, with some celebrities that have been in the news mm -hmm. recently. Yeah, do you want to speak for a moment on, on what BRCA1 and BRCA2 are and, and how those would impact the breast cancer patient? In general, um, mm -hmm. just very baseline, mm -hmm. uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 are um, genetic mutations that increase the risk for women, some men, to, to uh, develop breast cancer. The reason why we want to know it is, want to know what that status is, is because of treatment uh, possibilities. So for most BRCA1 and 2 um, breast cancer patients or family members, uh, we want to we start mammograms sooner than later. Right now, the, the United States and the world kind of think that for the age of 40 is a good time to start, but if we know that um, a, a family member has um, a BRCA1 carrier, mm -hmm. first line degree relative, then um, we'll want to see them sooner. If the patient develops um, breast cancer, we'll want to talk about doing uh, bilateral mastectomies and an oophorectomy or removing the ovaries. Mm -hmm. um, so it does change, it does change what, um, what line of treatment we're going to offer Thank and you. suggest. Thank you. Are you at higher risk for breast cancer if you have fibrocystic breasts? That is a question that I cannot answer for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but fibrocystic breasts in general um, do, do not, they're not exactly um, putting the patient at a higher risk. All right. Thank you. Other questions? We have just a couple of minutes left for questions. So if you do have one, again, just uh, text uh, UNCCN to the number 22333, and then you can go ahead and text that question. Also, if you uh, don't have a smartphone but you have access to a computer, you can go to pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V.com forward slash UNCCN, and you can go ahead and find a, a place where you can uh, send those questions to us through the computer. All right. Our mails... With, gyne uh, with gynecomastia at higher risk if there isn't a family history? Not always. So gynecomastia can actually occur um, because of medications for other disease processes. It is always best that um, the history is taken at the time of, um, of the clinical visit um, and a good look at the, at the medications that the patient's on. All right. Is surgery contraindicated for inflammatory breast cancer no. or radiation? No, it is not. Surgery, uh, inflammatory breast cancer is one of those cancers that is such a, a high, um, high risk for, for such invasive process very quickly. It, it moves very quickly. So um, surgery actually is one of the first things that we will do for a patient with inflammatory breast. Radiation um, also fits that, that, uh, that process, but it won't be the, one of the first things that we do. And okay. it's not contraindicated. All right, thank you. How long until someone is considered to be free of breast cancer? So the happy thing about this is once a patient with a, in the curative stages of breast cancer is completely finished with all um, systemic therapy with um, the surgery, if they need radiation, the radiation, 
they are considered free of breast cancer. That does not mean that we let them alone. We do um, clinical exams, continue to do clinical exams. We follow um, all kinds of side effects or symptoms that a patient may have. Um, we do still do mammography. So, no. Um, we talk about patients being X number of years out, but that's X number of years out from their um, an original diagnosis, but they are considered cancer-free if, if we are in, a, in a, a curative stage to begin with. All right, thank you. Would you recommend cutting processed foods out of your diet and avoiding other products with endocrine disruptors as a preventive measure? Preventative measure. Everything in moderation. Um, I think that that. Um, in general, we need to cut out processed foods. Um, we, we, it's the same kind of concept to me. It's the same kind of concept as somebody taking supplements while they're on chemotherapy. Um, we don't know what that processed means. We don't know what it's got in it. We can take a kind of an overall look. Um, but the reality is we would all be better off um, avoiding as much processed food as we can. And I do want to recommend to our listeners that we have a variety of different educational videos. We have actually uh, over 150 different lectures, including some that are excellent on diet and nutrition and cancer, and all of that can be found at unccn.org and then going to our lecture library, and that's completely searchable. Mm -hmm. And I know we don't have time to get into everything on every topic here, but if you're interested in some of these and want to go into more depth on those, we do have some great lectures on some of the topics that people have been asking about here. Um, is the self-test the same for a male as it would be for a female? Absolutely, and we give males mammograms as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? We've got uh, just a minute or so left. All right, thank you so much for, for the questions. Uh, this has been terrific. I, I, I'm so pleased that, that we've had... Uh, so many people here, we've, we've had literally hundreds of participants that, that have tuned in, registered and tuned in through classes at community colleges throughout the state. Uh, we're, we're extremely pleased to, to have you all here, and we want to say thank you to you as students and to the instructors who've, who've helped to facilitate this. Uh, we hope that this has broadened your knowledge of, of caring for the breast cancer patient and perhaps uh, increased your interest in learning about other types of cancer and cancer in general. Uh, cancer is the leading cause of death in North Carolina. That's why the uh, General Assembly has graciously uh, provided funding through the UCRF fund for this program and others. Our next lecture for the community colleges will be on November 12th, 2016 at 2 p.m. Caring for the Patient with Lung Cancer with uh, Tammy Albert. So we uh, look forward to having you there for that. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can find us at unccn.org, so we hope you'll check us out there on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, email us any questions you, might have, you may have at unccn at unc.edu. Uh, let's see. I think I skipped by one slide. Oh, there we go. I ran right over that one, and I did not mean to. I want to um, acknowledge, as I did, the, the UCRF, or University Cancer Research Fund, and UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the North Carolina Community College at that system, and all the, the different community colleges within. Uh, we want to thank and we want to call out Renee Batts, uh, education Consultant for Health Sciences, and Katherine Davis, Business Systems Analyst with the Community College System, for their, their tremendous support and assistance in putting this series together. Also, our team here at the UNC Cancer Network, Dr. Tom Shea, Mary King, Max Gaynor, Alan Brown, Jean Sellers. We want to thank each of them because each of them has played a vital role, and this would not be possible without them. Uh, finally, Amy, thank you again for being thank here you. today. This, is, this has been tremendous. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Good luck, guys. All right. We wish you the best, and we hope to see you next month.